Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a guy that knows that there is nothing dirtier than a giant ball of oil. He is the captain. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Cheers, Captain. Today we are drinking Blackberry Days by Anchor Brewing in beautiful, beautiful San Francisco, California. Garage grade, three and a half bottle caps out of five. This is an IPA, so of course there is some hoppy bitterness, but the real action happens when the fruit is added during the secondary fermentation. The result is a funky synthesis of rich earth and ripe fruit. And the color of this beer is beautiful and amazing. This week's beer was brought to us by these fine, fine specimens. First, Angie in Cottage Grove, Minnesota. And a big cheers to Valerie in Austin, Texas. Next, we have Ava of the Drop-In Crew up in Vermont. And to Corey, keeping it weird in Portland, Oregon. Next up, we have Sarah up in Ottawa. And last but not least, Tracy in Maplewood, New Jersey. So thank you to everyone who has purchased a True Crime Garage shirt, donated to the Beer Fund, or supported our great sponsors. Because without all of you, this would not be possible. Make sure you follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, at True Crime Garage. And that is enough of the business. All right, Captain, everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Yes, uh, my son in law called. He was playing golf this morning, about 9.30. My daughter's been missing since this morning. She's eight months pregnant. She took her dog for a walk in the park. Mm -hmm. The dog came home with just a leash shot. So the dog came back without your daughter? Right. Okay, what is your address, sister? Well, I'm a... Is that where where she's... No, it's over at the Loma Park is where she went for the walk. Well, it's got like the address. I can't remember. What's your cell phone number, sir, in case you get disconnected? It's, um, um... 2003, Lacey Peterson's family, they step up their criticism of their son-in-law, Scott Peterson, saying that he sold his pregnant wife's car and he was considering selling the couple's house. Well, and like you always say, when somebody goes missing, when the family stays in the area, that that's a sign of something. Yeah. More importantly, I think when they leave the area, that's what always scares me, especially when a person is, is just lost. 
Mm -hmm. You know, because especially when you have a child that goes missing, usually the thought of the mother and the father is typically we don't want to move. We don't want to change our phone number. We don't want to do anything that will prevent our son or daughter from coming home. Mm -hmm. Meaning that given the opportunity, if their son or daughter who is being held captive has a window of time that's even three minutes long, if they can dial a phone to call me and tell me where they might be, or if they get away on foot or if they get away somehow from their captor, that they would return home at the very least. Right. And this, um, this husband, uh, is so worried about his wife, so worried about his unborn child that he, he sells her car and he's so worried. So he's thinking that maybe he should sell the house. Yeah. 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 And so what we do know for a fact is he did sell their car, her car. Um, I don't can't say for certain captain, but it might just be her family and her, her parents that were saying that he was considering selling the house. I don't know that that's fact, but still selling her Land Rover is a strange thing to do. I would think one. And then two, I don't really have a date for when this occurred. I don't know if we know the exact date of when it did occur, but what was later reported at some point was that the nursery room, remember that for the baby, the expected baby for Connor Peterson, Mm -hmm. they had already painted the room blue. They had already decorated the room. It was sitting there waiting for the baby's arrival. Mm -hmm. Only thing that room was missing was the baby. And Mm -hmm. guess what? When his baby and wife went missing at some point, he then starts to use that room for other things. I believe it was, he used it for storage or some point he altered the room at some point. What I'm pointing out here is these are actions of a man that I don't think is expecting these two to return. Right. And to play devil's advocate, his reasoning is that the cops have my truck and I need a truck for work. So I had to sell her Land Rover, which is pretty much a truck, and he had to get a new truck. Yeah. Claiming he couldn't do his job or whatever he Mm. needed his vehicle for using the Land Rover. Right. And yeah, I, I mean, I get it, it, but here again is another situation of a guy that seems to have an answer for everything. And, or if he doesn't have an answer, he makes one up and then changes it later. No, that that's yeah. exactly what I mean. He's squirming and, and weaseling his way out of what the truth is. The mm-hmm. truth is he couldn't get further from Lacey and Connor fast enough is really what I believe. Right. And I, again, I don't have the date for this, but I I have in my notes, it was roughly like five weeks into the disappearance, six weeks into the disappearance. Mm -hmm. At some point, his words, he's saying things like at some point we have to move on. You know, we, we, (laughs) right. Right. Again, this is, this is an individual that, that as opposed to the mom saying Lacey's mom saying there'll never be closure. They'll never be moving on from this. That, right, you know that that's the huge difference, right? And that's what I meant yesterday when I don't think, you know, I don't think mm-hmm. I don't care what his professor in high in college said about you know he was a model student, he was right, intelligent. Right. I would have loved to have a whole room full of Scott Petersons. I don't find this Bunch guy to be dick noses. I don't find him to be intelligent at all, mm-hmm. at least in the grand scheme of getting away with this crime. I don't think, I really don't think he thought that he was going to have to go through this scrutiny, that he was going to be under the microscope. I think he thought that if he set it up properly, narcissist, yeah, that at some point that they would just believe that she was abducted and everybody else would move on, Mm -hmm. that he would move on and they would move on. Now we have February 10th. This is when Lacey Peterson, this was her expected due date. It comes and it goes. And then February 17th, Scott Peterson's mother, Jackie, she tells the Associated Press her family believes kidnapper kidnappers abducted Lacey Peterson with the intentions of holding her captive until she delivered the baby. Yeah, and one of the reasons why they thought this was there was three women in Modesto that went missing, pregnant women that went missing from that area. And in a radius of, a, I believe, like 90 miles to 100 miles, there was there has been eight missing uh, pregnant women. Well, the whole case is going to take a turn, Captain, because on April 13th, 2003, 
The remains of a late-term male fetus were found on Richmond's Point Isabel regional shoreline north of the marina where Scott went fishing the day Lacey disappeared. Mm -hmm. The next day, a partial female torso missing its hands, feet, and head were found in the same area. Now, later, these bodies are, in fact, identified to be Lacey and Connor, and autopsies were performed, but due to composition, decomposition, the exact cause of death could not be determined. The medical examiner did note that Lacey had suffered some broken ribs prior to her death. So these injuries were not caused. They were not caused after death. This is when she was alive and prosecutors suggested that she could have been suffocated or strangled inside the Peterson home. Right. So this is going to put police on high alert because now that they found the bodies, they're going to, they're actually afraid that Peterson is going to run for the border because he is uh, hanging out in San Diego, uh, golfing down there with his family. Now, I have to admit here, watching the coverage of this investigation and as the news was breaking, you know, I didn't want them. You know, it's it's one of those situations, and we've been through this before on other cases we've covered, Captain. It's a situation where you hope they find something, but you also hope they don't find something. You know, because you want right, Lacey right, right. to be alive. You want Connor to be alive and well. Yeah. And it it started feeling to me like this guy was not going to get arrested. Like he was not going to have to go to trial because I was ultimately starting to get very concerned that they were never going to recover her, her remains. Right. And I remember it being early April when I really started worrying about that. And I worried about it a little more each day as the days went on leading up to April 13th, when they finally made that discovery. And then remember we had to wait a whole day till they found the female remains and then a whole nother day to get confirmation that that was in fact the two that they had been missing and looking for, for so long. Now, at some point they did, however, uh, rule this investigation, a homicide investigation. Right. They flip-flopped from missing persons to a homicide. And I think their thought was, at least for public perception, let's turn this up, let's crank up the heat on this thing, and let the public know that we consider this a homicide investigation because at that moment, the public opinion of this guy was so bad, mm -hmm. was so terrible, mm -hmm. he was already convicted in the public's eyes, and... Let's make this happen so we can get an actual arrest warrant for this guy. Because like you said, I think even days before they found the bodies, they were concerned that he was going to flee at some point. He was going to leave the area. Now, after the bodies are found, Scott Peterson, by this point, mostly had been staying in San Diego with his family. Santiago. And allegedly, he says this is to avoid media attention. Right. Now, Scott Peterson was ultimately arrested on April 18th. 2003 this is near uh, a golf course well, where he claimed to ha that he was going to be meeting his father and his brother for a game of golf right well the real slim shady please stand up well scott peterson's naturally dark hair dark brown hair had been dyed blonde mm -hmm. um his he was driving a mercedes benz mm-hmm which was, quote-unquote, overstuffed with miscellaneous items, including nearly $15,000 in cash, mm -hmm. survival gear, camping equipment, several changes of clothes, four cell phones, and his brother's driver's license. Right. Now, which, which I can't claim that he used the driver's license um, to get into the golf club at, at some point. Um, you, and you can or can't? That's what they claim that he used it for. Right. Uh, they also claim that the hair dyeing and the shaving to have a goatee was actually, um, at this point, he hired Mark Garagos to um, basically be his attorney. And Mark Garagos said, hey, we, we should alter your image. That way media will leave you alone. Yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about items found with Scott in the car or on Scott because there are some conflicting reports mm -hmm. from everything I found 
you know, the above items that I mentioned, the $15,000 in cash, survival gear, camping equipment, changes of clothes, four cell phones. Right. Just think about that for a second. All that cash and four cell phones and then his brother's driver's license. Those items, I can confirm that multiple, 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 almost every report I read state that those items is what was found on this guy. Mm -hmm. Um, Some items that I think are interesting that aren't mentioned in every single report. One is that Scott Peterson had his driver's license on him as well. This might back up Scott Peterson's father's story. The story I heard was that he was intending on using his brother's driver's license um, the day before to get a San Diego resident discount at the golf course. Now, yeah, like, yeah, something like you said, for the golf course. Yeah, yeah, like you said, there's we can't confirm if that actually happened or not. Mm. Uh, but on that same topic, a couple reports, and this was from one in particular was from Fox News, states that he had his brother's passport which is a whole Mm -hmm. different bag of worms than, uh, than the driver's license to get the discount. Right. This is, Hey, can I get the discount on crossing the Mexican border? Right. But I'm, I'm going to just believe his, um, his father on this one, as far as the driver, like driver's license is concerned. Some reports also state that he had 12 Viagra pills, 200 Mm. sleeping pills. Well, when you're watching a lot of porn, you know, and you're a little chubby and you can't get it up, you might need to pop some pills. Well, the combination of Viagra pills and sleeping pills have me very concerned. Suicide by boner? No. Mm. I think with the multiple affairs that he had during the course of his marriage, Mm -hmm. with the excessive porn watching after the disappearance, Mm -hmm which we now know is that was the death of his wife. Mm-hmm. I think that we are talking about an individual that is very likely a sex addict. Um, mm-hmm. and my concern is that the sleeping pills are not for him, that therefore other people, and he intends to use the Viagra and the sleeping pills at the same time. Just one person in the group is going to get the sleeping pills. Right. Scott Peterson's going to take the Viagra pills. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of giving them, um, uh, Arnold Palmer or, uh, Shirley Temple or a Jack and Coke, he's going to give them the old Bill Cosby. Now we also have in several, several statements. I don't know how it didn't work its way into all of them, Mm -hmm. but I believe this to be true. Either a dagger or a knife was found on him. Now I, that's what she said. I think the confusing thing here is that a lot of times survival gear is mentioned and it might just be getting lumped into that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Rope was also found in the vehicle, which is probably again, getting, you know, roped, roped into the survival (laughs) gear. Um, But the tricky thing here is we have a map quest map printed off of Amber Fry's uh, general area in which she lived in. Of and, course. and we have a guy who has said multiple times that he would still like to meet her. And we have a girl, we have a lady, Amber Fry, who is maybe the number one witness against this individual. Right. And it, it, I just, a part of me really wonders what his plan was because there is no way there's no way anybody's talking me out of that he that he wasn't fleeing, that he wasn't taking a one-way trip to, you know, this guy was going on a permanent vacation. Well, and the way they arrested him is they they followed him, and then they eventually they were like, okay, we, we, we have to pull him over now uh, because the second body was found. So it wasn't like a body was found and then he fled, but... Be, he had all the workings to, at some point, it, I think he had a plan to leave if he decided to take that that jump. If I, that think makes any sense. I think there was a good chance that they weren't lying, that, that he was planning to golf with his father and brother, and then that was a sayonara to... to his, you know, one last... Possibly, but what I'm saying is, like, I think we have evidence that he had it, everything's ready to go. 
Right. And if I decide to jump, whenever right, right, right. I decide to jump, it's there. He's you know? Whenever he needs to, he can pounce and he can right. jump. And I, I do, th- personally, I just think that that was kind of a, a good buy. Do you think he's going to try to kill Amber? I, I think that there's maybe more evidence that something, I think. Because they were still talking. I think if she would have agreed to meet him somewhere, mm-hmm. then he would have. Right. Or if she would have invited him to her home, which I don't think would have happened in a million years, obviously. But mm-hmm. um, I think he would have attempted something. I think he was planning on leaving that day after the golf outing. And I also have information stating that that Mercedes Benz was, I believe, in his mother's name, registered to his mother. Of course. So there could also be. There could also be some help and assistance with prior knowledge of from his immediate family. Right. Now, on April 21st, 2003, Peterson was arraigned. He was charged with two felony counts of murder with premeditation and special circumstances. The first degree murder of Lacey, obviously, and then the second degree murder of Connor. He did plead not guilty uh, at this arraignment. Lacey's family and the prosecution were seeking the death penalty. Now, before his arraignment, Scott Peterson was represented by Kirk McAllister, Mm -hmm. a veteran criminal defense attorney from Modesto. Kevin's father. I don't know who Kevin McAllister is. Kevin McAllister. We have, then we have chief deputy public defender, Kent Faulkner, who also was assigned to the case. Peterson later indicated that he could afford a private attorney, and this was the famous high-profile attorney, Mark Garagos. The judge changed the venue of the trial from Modesto to Redwood City because, obviously, Peterson, Scott Peterson, was um, you know, receiving increasing hostility in this Modesto area. Mm -hmm. Scott Peterson's trial began on June 1st, 2004, and obviously was followed extremely closely by the media. And we should say by just about every media outlet you can think of. Um, Scott Peterson's defense lawyers based their case on the lack of direct evidence and played down the significance of circumstantial evidence. They suggested that the fetal remains were of a full-term infant and theorized that someone kidnapped Lacey, held her until she gave birth, Mm -hmm. and then dumped both bodies into the bay. Well, one of the main things that they point out is probably the biggest error that the police made, and that was right after Lacey went missing, they actually said that Scott was fishing in the Bay Area the day she went missing, mm-hmm. this is what his truck looks like. And so their theory is somebody took her hostage, uh, she gave birth to the child, and then afterwards they dumped it in the same area that Scott was fishing in. Yeah, Garagos, uh, Scott's attorney, suggesting that a satanic cult had kidnapped the pregnant woman and, like you said, using information that they gained from media reports, could frame him by dumping the body and bodies in the bay. Now we have, well, uh, because there was an attack on a woman in Modesto and actually during that attack, they, they claim that there would be a murder sacrifice and they would, it would be on a pregnant woman. Okay. So there was claims of this and this was actually looked into by the police department. And they found this not to have any validity to it. The prosecution's medical experts contended that the baby was not full term and actually died at the same time as his mother and eventually was expelled from her uterus kind of naturally, I guess, is the cleanest, nicest right. way to say and it. And they're an expert on the stand. Did you, have you ever seen the expert? this expert on the stand? No, and I'm going to be full disclosure here, Captain. Um I, I did watch portions of the trial, but I, I didn't have the strength to sit through the entirety of, of the trial. He, he basically, he's on the stand to say that the, the baby, not even that the baby went full term, but that the baby died weeks and weeks later. And once he couldn't really prove that the defense is 
right, stating this, this. Right, right. The defense's star witness. At some point, he just starts yelling, hey, give me a break. This is not an exact science. I'm not even qualified to do this. I mean, he <laughs> loses his shit. Like, it's, I mean, it, it couldn't have gone any worse for the defense on, on this witness. So unlike Peterson, the uh, he's this guy is unable to squirm. He's and, unable to lie. <laughs> right. I want to give me a break. Give me there's, a break. I don't even know what I'm doing. This is not even a Zach <laughs> science. Well, some other weird stuff at the trial. Mm. Um, there was some weird stuff with the jury. One was removed. One member of the jury was removed and replaced early on in the trial due to misconduct. Mm. And then later the jury foreman, which is a very strange thing to see the foreman well, uh, removed, but this wasn't really so much removed because it's requested his own removal during the jury deliberations. Well, and I, I hate to keep cutting you off, but the, the first one was there was on the way into a courtroom, there was some talking and mm -hmm. it was simple. That's the, the dismissal of the first one. The foreman, he, he decided to go, but that was during the decision making process. Once, once it came down to right. make a, a verdict is when he said, uh, basically it was like a couple people thought maybe he was innocent and mm -hmm. then it got to a vote, I believe of like 11 to one and that he was like the last one. He was the one holding out. And he, he just didn't think that they're giving it due process and going over every point. And eventually, um, he also made claims that he was, you know, some of the jury members threatened his life and that he got in uh, physical conversations with them. Um, the other jury members obviously deny that. Well, regarding the evidence itself, you know, like we said, there was a lot of circumstantial evidence and an overwhelming amount of circumstantial evidence that pointed against Scott Peterson. Now, as far as physical evidence goes, the only piece of forensic evidence that was identified is that single hair that we spoke about the strand thought to have been Lacey's that was found in a pair of pliers on Scott Peterson's boat. Now, this uh, presented as prosecution evidence during the trial was the fact that Peterson changed his appearance mm -hmm. and purchased the vehicle using his mother's name in order to avoid recognition by the press. More evidence, Scott added two pornography, pornographic television channels to his cable service only days after his wife's disappearance. The prosecution stated that this meant he knew she was not coming home. Peterson expressed interest in selling the house, as we had said, that he had shared with Lacey, sold her Land Rover. So he he sold, as we stated, sold the Land Rover and changed the nursery at some point. The defense had a lot of different theories as to what happened to Lacey and Connor. And one such theory, this one I found to be uh, very interesting, and it's, it's a little different than the satanic cult uh, theory, but this theory is that was argued was that a sex worker who was accused of stealing checks from the Peterson's mailbox might have come in contact and murdered Lacey. Apparently, the uh, Modesto police detectives said, this woman, we know who she is. We've identified her. She's never been a suspect in the disappearance. And furthermore, the prosecutor would argue that the noted checks, the checks that were stolen, were stolen after Lacey had already vanished, arguing that this means that um, this woman was not around, was was not there doing this item, doing these bad deeds before Lacey Peterson went missing. All right, cheers, mate. You know what, Captain? I have to apologize to the good folks out there. Want to cheers you because my I'm doing something's up with my throat, my voice this week. I'm battling through it. Mm -hmm. um, it feels it's some heavy lifting over here, so I apologize if I sound terrible. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I do want to circle back to the the prosecution and the police's thought that. Scott Peterson made 
homemade concrete anchors and that these homemade concrete anchors were missing. And mm. they state in court that they believe that Scott made four or five of these homemade anchors and only one was found. The one that you had pointed out was found on the boat or in his warehouse. It was on the boat. And they believed that these additional anchors were used to hold Lacey's body down right. uh, underwater. And what they've found is when people do this and they anchor a body down that normally whatever body part that they use to anchor down, uh, if the body surfaces, that limb will be ripped off. And so the way that Lacey was found, I mean, as graphic as it is, I mean, there's no head, there's no arms, and, and there's no legs. Mm-hmm. So it's basically a torso. And one thing that I wanted to point out, and I wanted to make sure that I brought this up, was I had read on several blogs that people were confused why they spent so much time at trial arguing about what was used or what would have been used to make the one anchor that they did find. Okay. We have the defense who's saying, well, Scott Peterson used a, like a pitcher, um, some kind of smaller item to make the mold for this anchor that was found. Right. These weren't, it wasn't a big anchor. A lot of people see this and think, one of those big work buckets. Well, that's the prosecution is stating that it was either a paint bucket or some type of bucket from Home Depot that was used to make the anchors. Mm-hmm. And the reason why this is important is because keep in mind, the only evidence that we have other than the purchase of way too much concrete to make just one single anchor, you know, we, we they know about that purchase that was made, how much concrete he purchased. Right. So, so where's we, that other... Where did the rest of it right. go? He he claims that he used it on some concrete work at his home. Well, I think what he did was took some sleeping pills, a little bit of Viagra, and shoved it up his ass. Well, regardless, his his statement for why he purchased so much concrete goes against the prosecution's theory. The prosecution's theory is that he used uh, an item that was larger than this pitcher that the defense kept pointing to mm-hmm. to make the mold for the concrete anchor. The reason why this is important is the size, the size of the anchors that he was making is important because other than the evidence of the purchase of the concrete, the only other evidence that we have that these ever existed are the rings that were found left on that table on his workbench, let's say. Mm. And so they need the prosecution needs those to match the size of the rings, the anchors that we believe he made needs to match the size of the rings where the defense is going to say they don't match the size of the rings because look, he used this rather than those bigger buckets. Now on November 12th, 2004, a jury convicted Scott Peterson of two counts of murder, first degree murder with special circumstances for killing Lacey and second degree murder for killing Connor, Mm -hmm. uh, who she was carrying. The penalty phase of the trial began on November 30th and concluded December 13th when the jury rendered a sentence of death. On March 16th, Judge Alfred DeLucci followed the jury verdict, sentencing Peterson to death by lethal injection and ordering him to pay $10,000 toward the cost of Lacey's funeral, calling the murder of Lacey Peterson cruel, uncaring, heartless, and callous. Mm -hmm. In a later press appearances, Members of the jury stated that they felt that Peterson's demeanor, specifically his lack of emotion and the phone calls to Amber in the days following Lacey's disappearance indicated to them that he was guilty. They based their verdict on quote, hundreds of small puzzle pieces of circumstantial evidence that were revealed during the trial from the location of Lacey's body to the lies her husband told after her disappearance. Yeah, and from if you watch, there's a really interesting documentary on this. And it's, I believe, a six part series on A and E. One of the things that everybody says, defense and prosecution, is the trial was going shitty for the prosecution. People were bored out of their mind. The jury looked like they were falling asleep. And then when they called Amber Fry, that's where everything changed. Mm-hmm. And even the day before the closing, they thought Mark Garagos is a better closer. He's going to, he's going to, it's going to come down to the closing argument and Mark Garrick is going to win. 
Mm-hmm. And for whatever reason, the prosecution, which was so boring and lack of emotion, and this whole case is based on emotion. He came out, hit it out of the park, and Mark Garagos kind of, you know, pooped his drawers right in so, front of everybody. So we, we have Garagos who, from public perception, was kind of guaranteed to over deliver. Right. And he did not deliver. And then we have yeah. the prosecution who was kind of expected to hand us a, a, a boring statement, um, lackluster, if you will. And that, that individual comes out and, and nails it, really right. hits it home for the jury. Mm-hmm. And there's some thought, too, um, you know, in regards to the foreman, um, that the jury foreman, he asked for himself to be removed because he thought that the rest of the jury were going to try to vote him out or get him removed somehow. Yeah. from that jury. And if I could be quoting him wrong, but I believe Mark Garagos at the time thought, well, look, they don't have enough evidence to convict him, but this is emotionally based case. So they will. Mm-hmm. So he was actually hoping for a hung jury. Now, if that foreman stays on there and votes not guilty, then you got a hung jury and then you have a new trial. Mm-hmm. So, and then you could then, argue whether or not Amber's uh, testimony should be in. And a lot of people argue that, but it's pretty simple. She's a character witness. Right. And, and I think by her being in there and listening to the hours and hours of the t- tapes of him talking to her and him lying to her on the phone and, and the jury also gets to hear where he's actually at when he's making those phone calls. Um, yeah. And, and I think that's very damning. And she, in regards to Amber being allowed in and at the trial, I mean, come on. Look at all the time spent interacting with him, whether it be face-to-face or on the phone, leading up to the disappearance of Lacey and then afterwards. Right. Scott Peterson arrived at San Quentin State Prison on March 17th, 2005. He joined the more than 700 other inmates in California's sole death row facility. On October 21st, 2005, a judge ruled that proceeds from a $250,000 life insurance policy Scott Peterson took out on Lacey Peterson will go to Lacey's mother. Mm -hmm. Then we have the appeals process, Captain. So we have Cliff Gardner. This is uh, eventually Peterson's attorney stated that. Because I think Mark Garagos was like, I got to get out of this. So Garagos, you know, I couldn't think. I like Garagos a lot. I, I think he's very intelligent. Uh, I listen to him a lot. When He has a, a podcast with Adam Carolla. Um, it's called uh, Reasonable Doubt. So uh, if you're interested in hearing what this guy is like, check out his podcast. It can be difficult sometimes stating or you know telling others that you like a defense attorney. Because I think that a lot of times, Captain, that... Mm-hmm. People, not everybody, but it's not I, hard for me. It's because I like to tell the truth. No, I get that. Uh, mm-hmm. And I don't have any problem with Garagos. I actually find him. I don't know a ton about him, but I do find him to be attractive, very intelligent and, okay. and um, very good at what his role is to be. Right. Um, you know, I did say that I liked, um, I can't think what is it, Jose Baez. Did I get his name right? Yeah. The, um, <laughs> for somebody somebody who couldn't stand Casey Anthony, mm-hmm. you know, I couldn't couldn't stand that woman. Can't I can't stand I, you. I can't I mean I don't even let's not even get into that. Right, right, right. But I do I did like Troll. her attorney Troll. in the role that he played. Now what I mean by that is sometimes people will go sometimes people identify the defense attorney with the person that's on trial. Right. And they go, well, that's the guy that represented Scott Peterson. And you know what? I hate Scott Peterson. So therefore Garagos piece of shit. Well, well, yeah. And similar to like one of the things that you see is when, when Scott Peterson's family is leaving after they sentenced their son to death, the, the amount of people attacking his parents, you know, like you're going to watch your son die. Like they had nothing to do with this girl's disappearance. Mm-hmm. They they wanted to be uh, grandparents, you know. He ripped the he, he, he you know. So I I think when people attack people like that, it's just it's ignorance. 
Right. Right. <laughs> I agree. Well, so we have the thought of some appeals because we have um, his attorney, his later attorney, stating that there were mistakes made, there was incorrect evidentiary rulings that deprived Scott Peterson of a fair trial. On July 6, 2012, his defense attorney filed a 423-page appeal of Scott Peterson's sentence. Now, the state attorney general's office filed their response brief on January 26, 2015. Then the defense filed a response to the state's brief in July of 2015. Mm -hmm. This is where they claim that a certified dog that detected Lacey's scent at the Berkeley Marina had failed two thirds of tests with similar conditions. Yeah. So one of the things we skipped over in the trial is that they had a scent dog and that this dog magically got to the pier and picked up on Lacey's scent. And this is weeks afterwards. And if you even buy the prosecution's story, uh, Lacey was never on the dock. She would have been in a boat and then that boat would have been from the trailer put into the water. So the fact that they went with a sniffing dog doesn't make any sense anyways, but this dog has failed multiple tests anyways. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I see the prosecution do this where they are battling a defense that the defense just keeps coming up with all these random ideas as to what could have happened except for their client. Their client didn't do it, but any of, of, the, of these other possibilities are a possibility. Right. You know, they're trying to establish reasonable doubt. And I find sometimes that the prosecution gets swept up in this. And does the same thing. They start saying, well, here's all the reasons why he did do it. Oh, but it doesn't go with our story. It doesn't go with our theory, which is a dangerous waters to uh, for them to be in. Now, uh, November 20, 2015, uh, the defense filed a habeas corpus petition claiming that a juror had lied on her jury application and that there was evidence that neighbors saw Lacey alive after Scott left home that day, mm -hmm. Christmas Eve. On August 10th, 2017, the state attorney general responded by appealing by to the appeal by filing a 150 page document contesting the notion, disputing the claims put forward in the appeal, stating that the appeal ignored quote, overwhelming evidence that Peterson murdered Lacey mm -hmm. stating that the timeline of the crime was established by the neighbor who found the Peterson's golden retriever wandering in the street when its leash was still attached before the sightings of Lacey and her dog started coming out. Do you want me to break down this point real quick? Yes. So the idea is that roughly about 10, 18 is when the neighbor finds uh, the Peterson dog in the Peterson's yard. She doesn't find it in the park. She doesn't find it down the street. She finds it in the yard. She said this would happen all the time. They might be playing outside or not playing outside, but doing work in the garden, work in the yard, and the dog would be out front, and she'd bring the dog back around to him. This time it was a little different because the dog had a leash on it. So she claims that she took the dog with the leash put it back in the yard, right. shut the gate, left the leash on. Dog is secure in the backyard. Which I find strange because if I found my neighbor's dog with the leash on and it was wandering around, I'd probably take the leash off when I put it in the backyard. That's just me. But she left the leash on and then, the, then about 15, 20 minutes later, the mail man delivers. Now he said that their dog always barked at him, mm -hmm. whether inside or outside the dog always barked at him. He claims that the gate was open. <sighs> this is what I love. All these Scott Peterson supporters say, if the mailman is correct in his time, which he should be because he's, his time is based off of him scanning in mail which document, documents this, the time. This would be roughly a half hour later after the neighbor states that they put the dog in the Peterson's backyard, in right. the fenced-in backyard. So what they're claiming is since the gate was open again, that this proves that Lacey was home, and this proves that if anybody opened that gate, it was Lacey. 
That's what they claim this proves. It doesn't prove that at all. Yet you, you don't have to be a genius to figure this out. There's so many possibilities of why that gate was open. The gate was open, then the dog was put back, and then the the neighbor closes the gate. Did she not close the gate well enough? We don't know. Did the did the gate have a bad latch and that's why it was open in the first place? We don't know. But what we do know is that when Scott Peterson comes home, guess who still has a leash on? So it's if 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 Lacey was there and she reopened the gate, then why wouldn't she take off the leash of the dog? I mean, they think they claim that this is proof that she was alive uh, at ten thirty, ten forty five, and I I think it's proof of nothing. Well, it's just proof that the the gate was open. People get confused, you know. If you go to certain websites, you watch certain documentaries. Things are skewed in a certain way, showed under a certain light at a different angle. It's easy for somebody to flip sides and think, hey, this person might be innocent or this person might be guilty or, right. or so on and so forth. Well, and it, it gets it, tricky, but here's here's look, what I if, think that we... Well, hold on. But what I was going to say is, but if you're Scott Pearson and you're lying to everybody and you've been lying to everybody for a really long time and you're lying to your parents and you're lying to your sisters and you're lying to whoever your brothers, whoever you're lying to, lying to the world, then there's a part of you, you know, if you're his father, you want to believe him. You want to believe that you raised somebody better than this, right? And and so I, I feel bad for them because they're trying to prove that he's innocent. We're, well, hmm. back to the, the whole dog thing and the neighbor placing the dog in the fence, that occurred at what time? They think roughly, roughly 10, 10, 10, 10, 15, 18, yeah, 10, 10, 18, 10, 20. So let's say in the window of 10, 15, 10, 20. What I think that people are failing to recognize here is that remember the statement of 11 witnesses stated that they saw Lacey Peterson with their dog walking her dog. Mm-hmm. Okay. And remember those statements, the statements that I found do not specifically name Le- Lacey Peterson. They state, I saw a woman and her dog or a woman matching Lacey's description and a dog matching that description. Right. The other issue here that's very difficult is if the neighbor found the dog by itself, places the dog in the fence between 10, 15 and 10, 20, any of those sightings, any of those witnesses that come forward and say that they saw the dog with Lacey after 1020 did not see Lacey, did not see Lacey and did not see the Peterson's dog. Right. Unless, unless here's what happened. She let the dog out. Right. And then she went and stole another dog that looked just like her dog and walked that dog. That's probably what happened. Well, I think ultimately what happened is, I think the jury got it right. I understand that all they had was circumstantial evidence. I see what I believe to be a mountain of circumstantial evidence. I know that it is called into question uh, my next statement here, but I do believe that it's likely Scott Peterson told his in-laws that he went golfing that morning, and then later he's saying that he went fishing instead. I don't think that this guy was smart enough to understand or to believe that he was going to have to answer the amount of questions that he was going to have to, to come across. Right. I don't believe that he thought he would be investigated as early into this as he actually was. And I think at some point he squirmed when, when presented with the idea that he was golfing and he had to prove where he was. Well, guess what? Fishing still proves that I didn't kill my wife that in the window that I'm going to lead you to believe that my wife was murdered. Um, I wasn't here or available or with her during that time because I was fishing and here's my proof that I was fishing. Here's my launch ticket. Here's the receipt for that. And I think this was absolutely premeditated murder. I think he planned to kill her before he purchased that boat. I believe that she likely didn't know about the boat. Mm-hmm. And persons close to her and him didn't know about the boat. I think he pre he premeditated the murder of his wife and his to be son. 
And he did this, I think, I think, I don't think he did this for Amber. I don't think he did this because he wanted to be with Amber. I think he just did this for himself. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is I think, I think all this, all this stuff, you know, the, the purchasing online by Lacey that morning, I think, so what he, he took her debit card or credit card and he bought something on a website that he knew that she shopped on. Yeah. That's not hard to do. Yeah. He turns on Martha Stewart, why he's preparing things to, to take it to San Francisco Bay. And he listens to what's going on and says, Oh, I remember Martha talking about this and this and this while Lacey was watching it that morning. And then he conveniently goes into work where he's picking up his boat, Mm -hmm. transferring the body at some point from the truck to the boat, taking the body out into the water, tossing it over the side of the boat at the trial. At the trial, Mm -hmm. we have the defense that says, Oh, the prosecution uh, took out a boat that was, uh, similar to, um, Oh no, 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 I'm sorry. I got this backwards. The defense stated we, we have a boat, same exact boat as Scott Peterson's took it out to the bay Mm -hmm. and using the weight of Peterson as an example and the weight of Lacey as an example, trying to toss that body over into the water made the boat capsize. Therefore, Scott Peterson could not have done it in that small of a boat. Mm -hmm. The prosecution fired back and stated, uh, well, let's do, let's use Scott Peterson's actual boat and go out there and conduct the same test. And the defense quickly let that slide. They didn't want to see that happen because I don't think that they believe the, the show that they put on much like the show that Scott Peterson was putting on this whole time. I think he fabricated this alibi. I think he did things to make it look like Lacey was alive longer than she was and that he was gone at the time that she disappeared. Right. He likely, he likely after driving mm-hmm. off with her body, either in the truck or all, you know, he, he, he might have even had the dog with them and releases the dog on the side of the road, a couple blocks away, mm-hmm. hoping the dog walks home, returns home and the neighbor finds it. And then we have this situation of, of his boat that, that he's keeping at the warehouse. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I really think he had a he had a place that he could go and he could conceal moving that body very briefly into that boat. And then he goes out onto the water on what day? Christmas Eve. Why? He's not expecting to see anybody else out there and he doesn't want to see anybody else out there. Well, just to play devil's advocate, defense did present the idea that he saw somebody out there. They claimed that there was eyewitness that saw um, Scott Pearson in a boat. And that there was nothing in the boat um, that was false because we know that we had he had fishing equipment. He also mysteriously had a tarp in his boat. But this credible eyewitness that they bring up in all these documentaries and say that once he gets to trial, you had this information, you could have called him in the first trial. You didn't. I think they didn't because I think this guy was full of shit. He saw a guy in a small boat because, again, it's a fresh water boat and you're in salt water and that was kind of funny and you're wearing camouflage clothes and I don't think this guy saw that. Also this idea that there's these satanic killings and that they're going to take a mother and take the baby and blah, blah, blah. There's no evidence of that. So uh, come up with something a little bit better. Now the missing pregnant women. Hmm. That's kind of an interesting theory. I love how they say there was eight of them. They don't tell you what happened to the eight of them, how one was found, one was not found, one was found dead, one was found alive. And yes, there was somebody from Modesto, pregnant woman, that she was found. She washed ashore. They did not find her baby. And same scenario. It was a torso. So the the cops made a huge mistake by stating where Scott Peterson was. Because if somebody did do this killing, you got a perfect place to dump the body. Mm -hmm. And then you get to frame this guy. So then the other thing too, and I think this needs to be looked at more, is the prosecution claims that the burglary 
took place on the 24th or took place on the 26th and not on the 24th. Well, they actually can't prove that. And based on reporters that on the 26th, the Scott Peterson neighborhood was filled with media. So we're talking about the house that's right across the street and the people right across the street. You would think that robbers are not going to break into a house when there's tons of media sitting around on the 26th. So I think that's something, you know, if you want to argue that point, I, I might listen to you a little bit, but let's start with December 9th. You get caught. You're dating a girl. You're married. You're having a child and you're dating somebody and you get caught and you tell that person lie upon lie upon lie. And then you go, Oh, by the way, I was married, but guess what happened to her? She went missing. Oh, when did she go missing? Right before Christmas. It's going to be my first Christmas without my wife. Doesn't say that she was pregnant. Still, again, another lie. And is he a fortune teller? You know, what are the odds that he tells somebody his wife went missing on the 9th and then on the 24th, she goes missing? The defense likes to say, well, you know, on the 24th, that Lacey got her hair done and Scott actually invited the hairdresser back to the house. And so that proves that he wasn't planning on killing her that night. That doesn't prove nothing. Come over to the house, watch some football with us, eat some pizza. I'm going to kill her in her sleep anyways. I think he probably then they went back. They're watching TV, eating pizza. He probably put a little sleeping pills And in her drink, she passed out. He suffocated her. I think he had two tarps. I think he put her on one tarp, but lined it with the other tarp. So the tarps, uh, the tarps were touching, but only one tarp was touching the body. I think he then wrapped her body up in that tarp. I think he put her in the truck, uh, and had two tarps. And then on Christmas Eve, he decides to take three umbrellas, two giant, three giant umbrellas from their backyard and store them at his work warehouse. What is the point of that? Cause I have to cover up the fact that I'm taking a body and put it into my truck. And then what does he do? He, he stages it. Like you said, Oh, let me put her bench out. You know, they, they claim that the bench and the, and uh, her putting out the bench and having her, curling iron and all that stuff proves that she was alive on the 24th. Maybe she was alive on the 24th. Maybe he drugged her on the 24th. Maybe he suffocated her on the 24th or maybe he staged it. It doesn't prove she was alive. It just proves that somebody in the house moved the bench, that somebody in the house put a curling iron out, that somebody in the house turned on Martha Stewart. It does not prove that Lacey was alive. You can't say, well, Scott watched Martha Stewart, so she was alive. No, no, no. It proves nothing. It just proves that that Scott watched Martha Stewart. And then he pulls out a bucket, puts some cleaning supply in it, probably bleach, cleans up the place, then puts the bucket outside, takes the dog, puts it on a leash, opens up the gate. I don't even think he dropped the, the dog off anywhere. I think he just opened the gate knowing that the dog is going to make it way outside the gate. He then takes Lacey's body, his unborn child's body that's wrapped up in a tarp. He goes um, to his warehouse where the boat that nobody knew existed. No proof that anybody knew about this boat. And he had anchors made. And one of the big things that people point out is he had this saw that was ordered and it showed up that day and he looked up instructions and he assembled the saw. Well, it was a wood saw, right? But this is a guy that takes a freshwater boat and puts it in salt water. He doesn't give a shit if it's a wood saw or if it's a metal saw. And I think he used this saw. The reason why he had to put it together is because he had to finish the anchors he was making. So he makes these anchors, which we have proof that he has one in his boat that's tied to nothing that proves that's evidence that it wasn't being used for an anchor. It was going to be used for something else. And maybe when he gets out there, 
Again, he has a tarp. He has, um, so he has her body in the tarp. She's in, and she's now either in the back of his truck or she's in the boat. And maybe there was an eyewitness that saw Scott and maybe he didn't see anything in the boat, but maybe the boat wasn't packed up yet. And that that's my only explanation for that. Or the guy just didn't see what, what do you know what, what time saw. the witness states he saw roughly, Peterson? Roughly the same time that, uh, I mean, there was a, a bunch of eyewitnesses that actually saw Peterson at the dock. And that's because this guy that's supposed to be this avid fisherman and this guy that has a boat, he was so bad at backing up the boat to put it in the water that people were like, whoa. And we're talking about a small boat. So, again, lie after lie. You also then say, I didn't want to go golfing because it was windy and rainy. And okay, you don't want to go golfing, but you want to go boating when it's when it's windy and rainy. So then you get out there. She's in the boat now. You have your little homemade anchors that you got from Home Depot. And you tie, tie her limbs up and you get her out of the boat. And you're gone for about an hour and a half. And then you decide, hey, I'm going to call her. Uh, I established that I'm gone because what you're trying to establish is that she went missing and you weren't there. Not that she was murdered, that she went missing and you weren't there. So you call her, hey, honey, I forgot to pick up that thing. Can you pick it up? I know you can't because I killed you, but can, can maybe you can pick it up for Pappy or whatever the fuck you said. And then you get back and then you're like, oh, I got to take a shower. I'm going to put my clothes in the washer because I need to have them washed because it might have some evidence on it. Oh, that bucket of cleaning supplies that I claim that you're going to mop the floor. No, I'm going to dump that out. So you do that. Then you call. Oh, time goes by. You think you'd be going, hey, we have a party to go to. What the hell's going on? Where's she at? You don't call 911. You claim that you're talking to the neighbors. You claim you're going to the park. Then you go and you tell the police officers, our marriage was fine, which was a bullshit lie because you have a affair. It's just lie upon lie upon lie upon lie. And I mean, I could keep going on and on and on. It's like, it's just ridiculous. And then their bodies are found. Miles from where you were at. One mile. How do you explain that? You sell her car. How do you explain that? You d- you dye your hair. And and I understand that there's this idea that if there's um, a point of evidence, but it also points to guilty or innocent, that you're supposed to go to innocent. But how many times are we supposed to do that? If it's 100 times, are we supposed to do that 100 times? No, absolutely not. Does you being a liar, does that make you a murderer? No. Does, does you having an affair make you a murderer? No. You lie a million times, uh, maybe you are a murderer. You're a narcissist, for one. And, and I think here's where people get it wrong. When people sit there and say, well, the media did this to him. And the, no, 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 no. He did it to himself. He's the one that chose to have an affair. He's the one that chose to to lie to the girl that was his girlfriend. He's the one that then told her that his wife went missing. He's the one that lied to everybody over and 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 over again. Right? And he so he did this to himself. The media didn't do this to himself. I do think the cops messed up a little bit. They were searching in the bay for her body. Then they find the bodies. You know what you need to be searching for? The anchors. Because the anchors, that's your murder weapon. Right? She might have been suffocated beforehand, but those those anchors, that that is a nail on his coffin. That's, to me, definitive proof. I think they could have found those anchors. Uh, I think they could have proved... And all along the way, you know, people have these things where they go, let Lacey do about the boat. No, there was no proof that she knew about the boat. There was just proof that she went and took a piss at the warehouse. Um, they could have, 
they could have tested the cleaning supply that he dumped out. Was it bleach? There's all the speculation that people smelled bleach afterwards. Is it? And if it was bleach, does, does that mean he's trying to cover something up? Um, I don't know. I, I, Nancy Grace, which look, you can hate her for a lot of the stuff she says about other cases. Fine. I'll hand you that. But one of the things that she said, which I thought was very interesting was this case was you, you wake up, right? Go to work. It's a sunny day, beautiful day out. Go to work. It's time for lunch. You come outside branches all over the place, leaves on the ground, puddles everywhere. Did it storm? Did it not storm? You didn't see the storm. You don't you didn't physically see that it stormed, but you can see by the evidence that it did. And I think in this case that's why he was found guilty and that's why he got the death penalty. And I don't think he got the death penalty because he killed Lacey. It's he killed Lacey and a baby. The baby was about to be born. You know, that's why he got the death penalty. Well, you have to wonder too, you know, when people make all these little arguments, you have to wonder, did he purposely buy the boat with the fishing gear for the depth finder? Because he needed to dump them deep enough that they may not ever be recovered. Right. He also looked up currents, current patterns the day before. And the thing here is Scott Peterson, thank God he got the death penalty and hopefully his is a situation where they do in fact execute him. California is not very good at following through with that part of the penalty phase, but you know who he reminds me of and who he would have went on to be like had he not got caught? Because again, I don't think he did this to be with Amber. I think he did this for himself. I think that if had he got married again in another town in another state somewhere a decade or two later, mm-hmm. he would have done the same thing to that person as soon as he decided it was no longer working for him. And this would be a pattern he would continue to repeat time and time again. He reminds me very much of the individual Felix Vale that we discussed so many cases ago. Well, no, and I, I think the thing, t- though, too, is a lot of people go, look, he's claiming he's innocent. He's, he's telling his family he's innocent. The reason why he staged or was trying to stage that his wife went missing is that he couldn't be man enough to say, look, I'm having an affair. I don't want to be married. I don't want to be a father. But he couldn't be a man and say that. Well, that's kind of weird. You know, if you have a child, you should want to be a father. But he didn't have the guts to say that because it would make him look like a pile of shit. Right? And I understand that his his uh, family uh, want to defend him and all this stuff. But how many points of evidence do you need that your son is one of the biggest piles of shit that ever walked this earth? All right, I'm exhausted. <laughs> that makes <laughs> I need two to of take us. Take a nap. All right, if you would like to find the full archive of True Crime Garage plus exclusive bonus episodes of True Crime Garage off the record, you can do that at Stitcher Premium. For a free month of listening, go to stitcherpremium.com slash true crime garage and use promo code garage. And for everything, our merchandise, sign up on our mailing list. But for anything, check out the blog. I mean, if you don't agree with us on some things or you have some questions about cases, check out our blog. Uh, that's It's it's kind of on fire. And that's all happening at truecrimegarage.com. We'll see everybody back here in the garage next week. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter. Don't litter.